Yeah, welcome to the IoT and uh, remote O&M for coal-fired boilers uh, meeting today. The uh, I you know we we do think that uh, this is almost like the times when we switch from mainframes to personal computers that there's a tremendous amount of uh, of change that's going to happen in the industry and first of all it's going to be a very big market and what we're what we've done here is listed a, a number of additional slides and subjects and uh, we have a number of these table of content slides and behind it are some if not all of the uh, contents uh, for purposes of the webinar this morning but let's start with the overview here which is that the uh, flow control really in, in treatment is uh, going to be a couple hundred billion dollar industry when you include the combustion and steam uh, in the year 2030 but 88 billion of that total is going to be impacted by IIoT uh, 36 billion will be actual additional revenues that the suppliers will be receiving but 53 uh, billion will be essentially the uh, new routes to market for some of the uh, for all the suppliers so you might instead of sending working directly with the uh, end user or with an end user and a, and a single consulting company it may be through all sorts of third parties and uh, system suppliers and so and process suppliers and so forth so lots of different routes to market uh, because of all the information that these sensors will be supplying remotely here the other uh, thing to note here is that the um, market is going to be growing in, in about 13% a year, and that is not only our estimation, but on the estimation, certainly, of the IIoT uh, analyzer community uh, broadly. The... Um, bigger market is going to be in East Asia. The, um, uh, you know, coal-fired power is really increasing at a rapid rate there. But interestingly enough, NAFTA is going to be a pretty big market because we have to automate really uh, large numbers of older coal-fired boilers in the United States. So that's, that's going to be a substantial market. We're going to delve in briefly to the markets in uh, uh, certain product areas here, just as an example. And one area is uh, ultra pure water. And the uh, uh, ultra pure water market will be about 12 billion in 2016 for ultra pure water systems. But of that total, the amount of um, IOOT related for you know, all these different ultra pure water applications is going to be close to 4 billion. And of that, you know, uh, certainly power is going to represent uh, over a billion dollars. Now, this is, I think, one area where you definitely have a lot of uh, potential for uh, remote monitoring and O&M. And you've got numbers of a number of types of companies like Danaher, for instance, has all sorts of activities in water monitoring and the chemicals and now with Paul filters and so forth. So they have the advantage of uh, leveraging all this product uh, knowledge as well. And so you have um, another group that's going to be um, effective and uh, needs to be uh, paid attention to are the procurement as a service companies. And so, you know, Accenture, Wipro, Genpact, and others are definitely um, the companies that are going to be um, helping outsource products. So it means if you're selling a particular product, you may be able to sell it to a whole fleet 
of plants rather than just uh, one plant. And you may be negotiating uh, based on a software package that has been uh, supplied by one of these majors. And, you know, the, the flow serves the GE Waters, Avivos, Accudines are all companies involved here. And essentially, you've got uh, a lot of different uh, measurements that need to be undertaken in ultra pure water. And in water treatment chemicals, generally, and certainly in ultra pure water for power plants, someone like Corita is already supplying remote monitoring systems and supplying chemicals as part part of all that. And you know they do do the sensing, the control, remote monitoring, and then they do the analysis. But in the uh, systems that were uh, of the future with the uh, cloud-based systems, you've got the uh, potential uh, for data analysis to be done at several different levels. So Carita could be providing data analysis based on their view from the chemical standpoint, but that would go into the cloud system that's furnished by Genpact or uh, IBM or, some, or one of the other uh, companies here, and compare to some of the other uh, data that's being uh, provided in other parts of the process. And when it's all put together, you come up with different conclusions about how to move forward than just looking at, at one of, you know, just adjust the water treatment chemicals and water quality generally. Uh, NOx control is a, is a very big area here. And um, you've already got MHPS that has a remote center in the Philippines and is expanding into uh, uh, monitoring of uh, the rotating parts in all the different coal and gas plants that it's involved in. In Asia, it has another uh, uh, center here in Orlando. But, um, you know, these, these companies such as MHPS and Siemens that already have these remote senators, centers can certainly add um, the cloud-based uh, platforms to integrate remote monitoring from FlowServe valves or Howden fans, or in a case like uh, Yara, who has a, um, a remote monitoring center already, they're they are remotely monitoring NOx uh, and reagent uh, consumption, but also the uh, amount that's in storage. So, you know, I see uh, that, uh, that, that Scott Fraley's on the uh, phone with us here from uh, Carmuse, and so the same thing that Yara is doing on uh, on uh, urea, uh, you could be doing with lime. And, and by the way, Scott, have, are are you already into that, or is that something for the future for for you people? Uh, right now, that's something for the future that we're 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 very deeply looking at. And Carmuse is probably better positioned than anyone to do that, right? I mean, in other words. With the expanse of uh, lime and other uh, calcium facilities that you have to supply around the world, um, you've uh, you, you're certainly in a in a good position to be doing that. And yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, did you want to make a comment there? No, no. Uh -huh. Oh, well then. Uh, the uh, the other thing is that uh, you know you get into the details here too of the subsystems like SUDOPT and so forth. So that anyway, this is the Knox area here, and the um, the cost of sensors is falling while uh, the ability to measure the parameters is expanding. And so in the Knox area, you have this whole you know uh, pyramid from data to information to knowledge. To wisdom, and when you get into the details there, you get uh, you know the data is the sensors and the instruments, and then you've got the wireless telemetry, and it's broadcasting all this pressure knocks and all these other uh, all this other data. But then you have historians and edge computing, and that uh, 
and then of course you have the the tamper settings and so forth themselves and then then you get into the knowledge end of it and here we say that um, there's a lot that needs to be contributed because from all this data the end user is going to need to know what to do and if for instance his uh, Nox or his mercury levels are uh, rising he has to know what to do with his catalyst and so we got the catalyst people together and we said look what are the alternatives to uh, bring a, uh, a catalyst back to original uh, performance and it turns out that there's actually three of them one is physical cleaning one is chemical cleaving cleaning which they call rejuvenation and then a third one is actually adding a pressure of precious metals but somebody has to decisively classify those options and, and that's one of the roles that we hope to be playing as well but then the uh, the, the wisdom comes from uh, subject matter expertise and uh, certainly with you know with uh, three of the people we have on the phone here with uh, uh, the lime people and the precipitator uh, people and the people making the uh, gears and so forth you have all sorts of expertise and within your organizations to designate experts by process and by product and by technology uh, that can be available 24-7 uh, uh, as as these problems come up uh, is going to be very, uh, very valuable. And uh, one of the, the things that struck us, and uh, I might just start out by asking Tom, is we believe that, that remote monitoring of precipitators can lead the way for this entire IIoT for coal-fired boilers. My impression is that a number of of uh, precipitator manufacturers are doing some level of remote monitoring. Uh, is that your impression as well, or your knowledge as well, Tom? Well, most of the control systems have the ability to do the remote monitoring, but um, but their systems aren't. Uh, uh, aren't really sophisticated enough to just monitor. They usually have monitoring control, and so most of the plants uh, are a little reluctant to let gain, give you access because you have the ability to mm -hmm. actually shut the equipment off or maybe cause some other issues environmentally. So um, I'd say the systems need to be upgraded a little bit so you just have the capability to monitor, you know, uh -huh. and not affect operations. But all manufacturers are doing that yeah, at one, one level or another if you buy the system. At, able to remote monitor well and I got to turn to one of your to you, uh, slide that uh, uh, involves you in a minute here but we've calculated what the third party uh, potential revenues can be and so in visualizing taking it not only to the remote monitoring but also the actual replacement uh, uh, parts and uh, supervision and so forth so that uh, m maybe a, a, a local uh, entity puts in the material, but with your remote monitoring as a manufacturer, uh, you can uh, control what what repair parts go in and when they go in, and all these uh, different uh, uh, needs that uh, that come up uh, as uh, you need to keep the performance up to uh, certain levels. But anyway, that could be a 1.4 billion dollar uh, market. With increases of a couple hundred uh, 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 million dollars a year, so uh, that's a pretty substantial opportunity for all the precipitator manufacturers of the world. And as as we all know, there's a number of uh, new uh, precipitators going into places like Vietnam right now, and Long King, King and Fida and people like that are are selling lots and lots of precipitators in, in Vietnam, for example, and uh, so this is just a calculation of, of what we just talked about about a very substantial market but uh, then you then you ask who's going to do all this well you know you can have the Dusans and the Mitsubishis and to some extent uh, certainly MHPS is probably going to want to do this out of their remote monitoring center but that doesn't mean that they can't 
not be working with FL Smith and uh, with NWL and with the Valve and the Fan people. And then uh, somebody uh, like Tom's company, which is TRK, uh, for the specialized uh, consulting. So <clears throat> all these uh, potential companies have a role to play, and some will be competing with the others. Obviously, a Thermo and Thermo Fisher and SICK and these others that are providing the continuous emissions monitors uh, are, uh, are are ones that. Um, uh, you know, have a, a, a big role to play here, whether they're going to take a central role or whether uh, they're going to take a, a very minor role is, is another question. But on the other hand, somebody like Thermo Fisher is uh, a worldwide company, and I would imagine they're going to want to take a bigger rather than a, a smaller role. So, uh, Tom, here is uh, uh, some information on your company here. Would you just want to give us a a little, you know, a four or five minute dissertation on what uh, what you offer on a remote basis for precipitator suppliers. Our first well, operators. usually we work with all the different systems, you know, because every manufacturer has a unique interface, um, and so uh, and you know, really, what we all we need besides just looking at the precipitator, we also need process data. So that we usually are just not monitoring, but we're monitoring and troubleshooting. So we have a couple clients that, you know, are looking for us to look at on a regular basis. Usually that's quarterly, you know, and then maybe give them some pointers about where they're having some trouble. But typically, most of it would be when they're having issues and they're having opacity exceedances would be the more reason that we would remote monitor in. It's uh, even if we wanted to fly there, it might be a day or two before we could get there. And they're they're usually in a some type of uh, limit caused by emissions, you know, load reduction on boilers or something like that, and so that's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, uh, sometimes per day when they're dropping, you know, you know, 25% load or something like that. That would be like the normal case when they panic, and so they'll have us dial in to look at it. Um, you know, either uh, the old days we used to do it through the phone modem, or and now we're doing it through a VPN or we'll do it through some kind of uh, mirror software, you know, to, on, that's loaded onto their computer, and we'll, um, and then we'll uh, try to work with someone at the plant at the same time, so uh, they'll go out and act like our, you know, you know, eyes and ears and, and uh, do things for us uh, out of the equipment. So remote monitoring itself gives you the ability to look at it, but you actually need someone there in the precipitator equipment is kind of more sophisticated. You need someone there to go out and maybe make an adjustment or make some modifications to see if we can improve it to try to, uh, you know, reduce our emissions and get their load back up. So that would be the normal case. Uh, and here on this slide here, the CAMS plans and CAM insurance plans, some of that required reporting to be done. So sometimes we'll take the data and we'll put it in a report format that they may submit on a quarterly you know, report to the EPA or local state regulations, um, and uh, and uh, also they, you know, they may be required to have someone look at it on a regular basis, as depending on what the permit's written. And so that remote monitoring also qualifies for that. You know, that they're meeting their their uh, permit. Yeah. But uh, but those would be the normal things out of the country. It's usually also because they're having issues when we're out of the United States and it's difficult to get to. And a lot of times we could troubleshoot problems with their transformers or their controls or their process remotely, you know, and, and get them back on track before they cause issues or damage the equipment further. So that would be kind of the normal couple of incidences where you'd use remote access, you know, prevent further damage, you know, get them back in compliance or prevent loss of, you know, Make megawatts due to load reduction. So now that's very valuable, though. You know, yeah, you know, real quick. And every every time you get into a, a situation, you learn a little bit, right? In other words, uh, every situation is unique, and but the fact that you've done so many of them, you have a a lead or a, a level of expertise that is a function of your experience. I, I suppose if you want to put it in those terms. Well, a lot of times they have a contract, say, with one of the manufacturers, you know, B&W, Neuendorfer, or somebody else that is doing it, and those guys aren't process-oriented. So you have to know, you know, you have to know a little bit about 
the whole picture, just not the specific equipment. That would be true with any other system too, because all these systems interact. Yeah. So yeah. Some, the problem isn't necessarily with the precipitator, but it might be with the boiler or the you know uh, pulverizer or something else going on in the system, and so you have to be familiar with that whole process. To for basic ones you can fix. You know, there's something wrong, but it's when it's they really can't you know can't figure it out is when you need to be a little bit more of a consultant. And I really only have three people in my that could actually do that. You know. Um, because uh, it really takes a little bit knowledge of and experience. You know, right. So but that's if you had monitoring, that's troubleshooting, you know. So. But if you had, you know, hundreds of utilities using your service around the world, it would seem that, you know, your lead and expertise, your knowledge is going to be uh, much, much greater. And, you know, the more specialized you are, the more uh, expertise you're going to have relative to, to others and the more the in demand. Put it another way, you know, here's a uh, here's Vietnam with very few sophisticated precipitators, but all of a sudden, you know, another 30 or 40,000 megawatts of uh, sophisticated uh, complex precipitators. You know, where are they going to get the knowledge to uh, operate them? properly and if someone like well, we yourself... actually started a job up in Vietnam recently we you know and that was the case is they brought us in from the United States actually to do the startup and stuff because there wasn't any expertise over in Asia for their equipment so that's, and, that's actually happening yeah and then um, so the the idea then to provide ongoing uh, support for them is certainly not impractical at all based on the fact that you've already uh, assisted uh, them. I completely agree. It's just most of the equipment's oversized, and so unless there's an environmental reason, a lot of plants aren't willing to spend that money, even though it is a good preventative maintenance, and and uh, that's the issue right now is the cost benefit, you know, from the service. So a lot of, actually it seems simple, but a lot of people don't see that cost benefit until they're having an issue with the equipment. You know, that's really hard for people on budgets to to actually spend that preventative maintenance money, which is what they consider the remote monitoring. I look at it more as training. So when we do the remote monitoring, I like to actually get involved with the plant personnel, and mm -hmm. they watch what we're doing, and they actually learn what we're observing, why we're concerned about it, and then we actually give them like you know a, a work order to, to correct something if we find it or modify it. So that, that training function sometimes is where you could actually get the money budgeted to do the remote monitoring because it's also a training program for their people. Because you know? they don't look at it for three or four months at a time at different people, and then all of a sudden when there's a problem, they have to look at it. And so by you know, so by working with them that way and getting to know them, and they actually get they learn from the experience of your work. You know, when you're trying to troubleshoot. You know? Oh, that's that's interesting, and so, you know, I'd I'd like to thank you for that. And I, and I think we want to keep pursuing that. And I think even on the training thing, the uh, what we might be talking about here in terms of a worldwide organization is levels. In other words, you're training people who are, uh, rather than doing it all through your organization, you're training regional people or various different. Uh, uh, it's a local subs. electrician or operator or something like that is responsible for the precipitator. But I'm even thinking of in between. In other words, uh, you, you've got this one level of expertise. You educate another group of people who are much more knowledgeable than the people actually at the plants, but not as knowledgeable as some of your people. And then they, in turn, provide that expertise to the plants rather than it all being centralized uh, you know, at, at your TA or arcade offices. But in any case, I think um, this is a good example, and I'm, I appreciate your input here, Tom, I think has been very helpful because it, you know, whether it's uh, lime uh, that, that Scott's involved in or some of these other things, uh, I, I think precipitator monitoring is already uh, ripe for taking it to the next level here. It is, yeah. You just have to get plants to commit the funds, that's all. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, that certainly is the, uh, uh, I think this whole IIOT program uh, is so cost effective that over a period of time it is gonna uh, there is going to be the demand for the services that we've been 
talking about here. But let's just maybe go into the overview at this point in time of the changing markets and the potential uh, in some of these areas. And uh, the what we've been saying here is is true in spades that uh, you know the accumulated knowledge has to be taken into account. And um, your, the low cost sensors and wireless transmission you know, generate huge amounts of data, but uh, it's digitally processed, but all that really means is then you've got more data that has to be converted to knowledge and then into to wisdom. So you need the expertise of the suppliers of all these different uh, products and processes and so forth and, and in order to take advantage of IIoT. And this, I think, is where the we, we've run into a, um, a problem is that uh, uh, the the IBMs and the Accentures and and uh, Genpacks and all these uh, uh, companies have very have, have made tremendous inroads GE on the IIoT part of it, but not on the IIOW, which is the Internet of Wisdom. So pulling all this together is needed, and we have some examples like our coal-fired power plant decisions. Uh, where we get into a lot of this and we get into, uh, you know, uh, various different wrapper uh, uh, discharge electrode designs and and uh, collection electrodes and all those different uh, uh, different things. And uh, when it comes to uh, valves and things, we get into the uh, various different uh, uh, programs. But for instance, uh, uh, you know, when you get into high temperature valves, you've got uh, Coatings and other things that are are making a lot of a uh, lot of difference. The uh, uh, we've taken another step further by uh, accumulating all the data on an individual utility. So for Berkshire Hathaway, that has 200 different uh, coal-fired plants, gas plants, wind, uh, and uh, uh, the the uh, uh, gas uh, pipelines as well, where they've got the compressor stations, they've got tremendous amounts of of equipment. But we've tried to identify, you know, what equipment is where, and even in terms of whose bags are in what uh, particular boiler, how long they last, or what what is the media, what's the weight, all those details. So. In order, to, you can be monitoring these things, but unless you know what um, what is actually there and how it compares to something else somewhere else, then uh, that data doesn't become very useful. And we are um, pursuing this to try to get decisive classification throughout. I just talked about how we've done that with catalysts. Now we're doing it with a lot of very uh, specific valve applications. Right now. We're going out to all the valve manufacturers and trying to determine, for instance, uh, for your supercritical uh, boilers and your steam cycle, you know, what for the 750 degree and above applications, do you use ball uh, valves, gate valves, or whatever? What do you do and use? And then, you know, are they trunnion or floating? And what materials, if they're coatings, how, to, how are the coatings supplied? How are the valves made smart? And then doing the same thing for supercritical uh, gas turbine combi uh, combined cycle and also nuclear plants. So that uh, that's an ongoing, uh, one of our ongoing uh, high performance valve analysis that's going on right now. And again, uh, providing this uh, structure in IIoT is important. Uh, we have deep dives in, in a lot of these areas. Uh, you know, we've been writing the uh, fabric filter knowledge system uh, since 1976. And right now with the catalytic filter, we think completely, uh, it will completely change coal-fired boiler operation and improve uh, efficiency uh, by recapturing most of the heat uh, that's now going out the stack. Uh, with the FGD and DNOX, uh, we're firmly convinced that 
an FGD system can provide a rare earth feedstock, which is a combination of fly ash and hydrochloric acid, at zero additional cost, so that the cost of rare earths will go down and coal-fired boilers will be the major supply source for rare earths. So these are some of the things that uh, uh, that, that, that knowledge and wisdom uh, can bring to the table. And of course, what we're talking about today is this whole industrial IoT and remote O&M service, uh, which provides uh, the IIoT portion of the total. The, um, you know, we do, as I, as I said, have all sorts of initiatives going on on, on pumps, uh, compressors, fans, various different filters, and then, of course, NOx and air pollution control. The data analytics is an important part of it. And we're really just starting to uh, fill out all the data analytics uh, portions of, of, of our service. We've had done, I have done uh, webinars with Exemplar, and they point out that basically uh, on the analytics, you've got really four different op, op ways to go about this. One is an experience-based model, and another one is a, a data-based model, and another one is physics, and then a fourth option is a hybrid of all those analytics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, processor information that needs to be uh, absorbed and analyzed, and uh, we're, these are some of the slide uh, titles that are in that section here presently. And the, uh, certainly the software is uh, critical here. And so you have uh, very broad types of software programs down to things like Valve Keep, which is a very much focused just on your Valve uh, inventory programs. And uh, so the uh, I, I think there's a couple of important points I wanted to get to uh, beyond this uh, list of table of contents here. But obviously, the distributed uh, control systems are being supplied by a number of uh, people, and they're part of the whole uh, program as well. And, and most of the people that are involved here have also moved on to the open platform uh, systems uh, uh, at the higher level, with the DCS being... Uh, you know, at, at the lower uh, lower level here, and the uh, advanced process control with you know fuzzy logic and ex expert systems, and uh, the neural networks and some of these other things here, and we uh, we've had a number of presentations for Pacific Corp, uh, nine hours worth actually on solving their NOx control problems, and uh, Emerson and Siemens and uh, uh, GE have all made presentations in those uh, webinars, and um, GE basically uh, basically is uh, saying that coal-fired power plants uh, uh, can reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 10 percent, but actually the, the software uh, upgrades uh, can add 1.5 percent just by them by themselves. So that's a a fairly important uh, conclusion and a big incentive for the uh, automation of all these plants. Certainly here in the U.S., the uh, older plants. Now with uh, with a, a administration that promises to extend the life of coal plants in the U.S., there is certainly the opportunity to automate those plants and reduce the cost of operation. The uh, GE has moved forward with the acquisition of NUCO and their neural networks so that you've got uh, uh, an ex the experience-based uh, systems that we talked about uh, earlier here. And uh, uh, NUCO offers uh, both the combustion opt and the soot opt, and so it optimizes fuel and air in the combustion opt and does it by experience and it moves around moves the uh, dampers around till you get the optimum settings 
and uh, that's the combustion opt. And then uh, uh, this is some of the other types of information which is in there. Emerson's been very active in this whole area with uh, systems at many power plants around the world. Siemens is uh, equally active. And uh, others are in the business as well, as you can see, for both the combustion optimization and the smart soot blowing. And here's uh, some information on the Siemens system. But uh, Siemens uh, purchased uh, or is actually licensed the Zolo TDL uh, tunable diode laser technology or uh, sensors. And so now you basically, uh, now you have a, a system which is measuring these parameters in the boiler at all times and can readjust the uh, damper settings to uh, and burners and so forth to optimize the combustion in that regard. So that's a, a sensor development with the tunable diode lasers. And the um, uh, Nucos set up, we don't need to really spend any time on. Um, from there, we move on to the sensors, and you've got a, um, a number of different sensors that need to uh, be improved uh, and are, are already uh, quite valuable. But there are uh, new, newer designs that uh, will, will need to be looked at, which can even prove it even uh, uh, further. So. Remote monitoring is something that we've already seen on precipitators. It's something that is going on now, on now with all the rotating parts. And so we do have um, a number of, of uh, companies that can provide that kind of information. Now, we do have, um, I believe, uh, one of the Rex Nord people on the line with us now, and Rex Nord is an example of one of the companies that's that's heavily in uh, to providing remote monitoring for their gears. <clears throat> and you can see that they have the network conductivity and they're uh, measuring the performance and uh, maintenance potential of their gears uh, with oil condition and vibration and, and, uh, and other data. But you know, tying that then into the uh, the actual uh, equipment to which it's supplied, uh, they're they're certainly a, a leader in engineered gearboxes and couplings for the large slurry pumps used in FGD. Now, there are you know a number of of slurry pumps. Uh, for instance, the ball mill has smaller pumps, and there are various different uh, pumps in parts of the FGD system, but the one huge pump requirement is the recycle slurry. And that is a, um, a pump that uh, can be uh, as big as 60,000 GPM. And for a 1,000 megawatt power plant, then you're gonna need uh, seven of those uh, big pumps. And they have multi-thousand uh, horsepower uh, motors on each one of them. So, you know, the gears for those pumps are certainly uh, critical. And um, just in, in, in looking at it on a, on a larger basis, in Asia alone, you, you're going to be, there, there are 385 of those big pumps that will probably be sold this year for new coal-fired power plants. But nearly 6,000 will be in operation in, in Asia by the end of this year. And these, with almost odd exception, are all plants that have been built in the last 20 years, and most of them have been built within the last 10 years. And so you have a lot of relatively inexperienced uh, operating personnel in, in all these plants in Asia. But it, it's, it's just unbelievable that China, for instance, operates uh, operates about seven times as many FGD systems as operate in the United States. And 
Vietnam and Indonesia between them will be operating more FGD systems than the United States uh, has in, in uh, five or 10, 10, 10 years from now. So that is certainly a, um, a metamorphosis there and a real opportunity for, for all the remote monitoring. So how, how will some of this happen? Some of this is going to actually happen through large uh, power plant joint, joint venture companies. Uniper, uh, which is a spinoff from Eon, is actually uh, signing a, an agreement with India Power and they're going to operate power plants throughout India. So you can see that they could be a major purchaser of a lot of the uh, services that we've been talking about here. And they could be an umbrella group putting this all together for a number of the Indian as well as uh, European power plants. We have a whole set of slides on this. One of them, uh, we have a whole set of slides on Luminant. And Luminant not only is monitoring the activities at all their own power plants, but they're doing so for industrial boiler operators uh, throughout their territories. So again, here is somebody uh, who all the suppliers can be working with and potentially could be impacting the purchases of supplies for products for many, many different uh, boilers. And again, opens up the opportunity for the uh, outsourcing uh, for these very sophisticated software programs that uh, people like Accenture and Wipro and so forth are offering. But again, only if, uh, will only be as successful as the wisdom which is applied uh, to all this. So the, um, uh, so, so I think this is a big, uh, big opportunity. And the, uh, another uh, certainly uh, dimension here is what the consulting companies are going to do. You've got ACOM and Kiewit and Burns and McDonald and Black and Beach and all these other uh, consulting companies that here in the United States have got a tremendous amount of expertise. And our thinking is that they should embrace this whole concept of worldwide uh, specialized expertise and develop their uh, consulting roles in such a way that they have experts to be working on IIoT and all these niche areas and the uh, people like uh, Brad Booker at, at Keywood, who's an expert on water chemistry, and he could be supplying his services to power plants throughout the world uh, at a fairly high consulting rate, but not not in, in the in the general consulting role that most of these companies have adopted. And most of them uh, uh, have avoided the developing the specialties, and they have more of the general project consulting. So I think there's there's an adjustment that needs to be made there. But the bottom line still is that they have the knowledge that could be invaluable to uh, utilities in, in Vietnam and Indonesia and, and the Philippines and these uh, other areas. The, uh, uh, so they, they certainly have potential for huge uh, revenues from all of this. And the question is, you know, are they going to take the, ball, the bull by the horns and develop their own uh, uh, software systems? Uh, and so they either, either will be uh, coordinating all this or working with others that are, that are coordinating all this as well. But there's some negative aspects for the consulting companies too, which this is going to be uh, the, the same kind of sea change you got from uh, the mainframe computers to the personal computers. And so the traditional consulting roles uh, are going to be uh, altered, certainly, and well, they're already, because in Asia and these other areas, you don't have the, the uh, 
consultants as we know them here in the United States uh, in the in the game at all. And this is an opportunity for them uh, to, to get a much bigger slice of the pie in these other areas. And uh, even I mentioned Trinity consultants here. And Tom was mentioning the, the CAM rule, but there, there's a need for specialized consulting on the permits. And so you've got somebody like Tom that can operate, make changes in the precipitator, but you've got to know the nuances of the various different rules and, you know, what what kind of emissions you can have on startup and and various different and how, how many, uh, you know, how long can you be out of compliance, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's another niche role that's there as well. And uh, I use the example of Brad Bucher here. He's made a number of presentations in our uh, water treatment chemistry, uh, on water treatment chemistry in our uh, gas turbine combined cycle and coal uh, webinars. But uh, you get a, a combination where uh, he would be the expert helping all these other uh, companies and the end user when all this information uh, gets put together. And the uh, 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 ACOM is another example here. They're, uh, they're, they were heavily involved. They, they, they were the consultant working with BHE when we did these nine hours of, uh, of webinars. But it was interesting that uh, we came up with all that, with the potential that they can avoid SCR by using some technology used in the refining industry uh, for NOx oxidation ahead of the scrubber using ozone and then a novel hybrid uh, reductant. So the knowledge that ACOM has acquired from that particular effort can be uh, be a very attractive to a lot of the uh, utilities in these developing countries where something a little bit less than full-scale uh, SCR may be attractive. So they've already got uh, IIoT leak protection programs. So it uh, is not that big a step for them to be moving into what some of the things that we've been talking about here. And then I did mention Trinity uh, Consultants and how they could be pro providing information relative to the uh, regulations. Uh, the, in terms of the special expertise, the kind of thing that Tom is supplying for precipitators, uh, this Laberlec, which is a part of the Belgian electricity industry, uh, is providing a lot of the special expertise, and it seems like they would be able to take this to the next level, maybe even become more specialized, but doing everything from uh, air filter inlets for gas turbines to water chemistry solutions for Asian power plants, and, and they do have some remote monitoring capabilities. So those are some of the uh, examples there, and I think gives a, over, a pretty good overview here of the potential in, in coal-fired power, which we feel is very large. And with that, uh, I'm ending the, the formal presentation this morning. Are there any questions or thoughts that uh, people have? Well, if not, I'd like to thank, thank you for attending. And the recording will be um, available as part of the whole NO31, which is the IOT and remote O&M uh, service. And we will be uh, conducting these webinars on a weekly basis and invite you to join us again. This is now Bob McElvain signing off for today.